In this video, we're going to start a fairly long and admittedly rather complicated discussion of tariff policy as an example of government failure. And we're going to, not in this video, but in a future video, we're going to try to put numbers on exactly to what extent uh, a, a policy like tariffs is damaging to the e economy. Uh, there will also be caveats. Tariffs are not always damaging to the economy, so we'll get to that. Um, first, though, a really quick comment. Because your book was written so long ago, y you may be unfamiliar with some of the terms that that the book uses. Let's see, the copyright was 1993, so I mean, most of the text was probably written uh, around you know before 1991 or 1992. The authors refer to the EC without defining it. The EC is the European Community, and the European Community was the forerunner of what we now know as the European Union or the EU. These are actually rather different organizations. As you may know, the European Union has a concept of citizenship. You can be a, a citizen of the European Union as well as, that is, in addition to a citizen of a particular country. Whereas the European Community had no concept of being, uh, of citizenship at all. You couldn't be a citizen of the European Community. In addition, most of the states of the European Union are, have a common currency called the Euro. Now, until a few months ago, the uh, United Kingdom was part of the European Union, but it did not adopt the Euro. But that was rather an exception. I, I believe the other European countries, I haven't looked it up, I believe the other European countries are on the Euro. The European Community did not have a common currency. So at the time that your book was written, the euro currency didn't exist. And so each country had its own national currency. Uh, Germany had the Deutsche Mark, France had the Franc, French Franc, Italy had the Italian Lira, and so forth. Uh, speaking of Germany, th when your book was written, the, uh, the so-called Iron Curtain was still up. So Germany was divided into two countries, West Germany and East Germany. West Germany was an ally of the United States and a member of NATO. East Germany was an ally of the Soviet Union and a member of the Warsaw Pact, uh, which was the, the East European and Soviet military alliance. Um, so the the book talks a lot more about West Germany than East Germany because West Germany was part of the Western Alliance, and so there's a lot more there's a lot more data available for West Germany than for East Germany. Um, uh, finally, the book discusses the OECD. Table one on page eighty five uses data that it credits to the OECD. The OECD is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It's an international organization based in Paris. When your book was written, the members of the OECD were uh, actually more or less the, uh, I think all, just about all the NATO countries were members of the OECD. So it was Western Europe, the United States, but it also included Canada, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. So basically, high-income countries. After your book was written, the OECD has expanded. It expanded to include many East European countries after the fall of the Soviet Union. It uh, now includes Turkey and Israel. It um, also has expanded in the Western Hemisphere, it now includes Mexico, I believe Chile, and Colombia. And there may be a few other um, South American countries that have now joined. It also, I believe, includes South Korea. But as I said, when your book is written, it was just Western Europe, the US, Canada, Japan, and uh, Australia, New Zealand. Now, what does it do? 
The OECD is mostly known as a statistical organization. For example, suppose you wanted to look up the oh, um, taxation rate for flour in France versus Italy. Without the OECD, that would be a pretty hard thing to look up. You would have to look at French government documents. So presumably, you'd have to learn how to how to read uh, French. You'd have to look up Italian government documents. So you'd have to know how to read Italian, and then you'd have to have pretty deep knowledge of the organization of government documents in these two different countries in order to be able to to find this piece of data. The OECD combines statistics from all its member countries into the uniform standards and reports it in I know it reports it in English I don't know what other languages it might use but in other words it puts it certainly puts everything into uh, into the English language so if you know English then you can find this statistical data about from all these different countries the statistical data is geared towards the economy, I mean the name economic cooperation and development. So the economy, public policy, like tax policy. So it's mostly a statistical organization, but the other thing it does is to ha provide a forum for government economic officials from different countries to get together and talk about things. So talk about international trade, talk about technical aspects like like the taxation of international trade and so forth. So that's what the that's what the OEC does. OECD does. So what we're now going to do is study this th this graph of tariffs. This is based on box 6.1 of your book around page 82. But I think the discussion in your book is too brief. So th my discussion is going to be slower. We have dollars on the vertical axis and the output of food on the horizontal axis. And what we're going to study is a policy that the EC, the European Community had, which the EU actually also has, which is to put a tariff on food imports into Europe. So if you want to import food to Europe, you have to pay a fee before you're allowed to do that. We have the domestic demand curve, which should be read in the following kind of way. If uh, the price is P1, then you use the domestic demand curve to determine a quantity Q1 which consumers would demand if the price were P1. If the price goes up to P2, you can see that because of the slope of the demand curve, the quantity would go down. So this obeys the intuitive idea most people had that when prices go up, consumers demand less of this particular uh, of, of a commodity. Now exactly proving this is something that economics majors need to do and in intermediate microeconomics. So we're not interested in proving it, we're just going to take as given the so-called downward sloping nature of demand curves. That when price goes up, people want less of a commodity. When price goes down, people want more of the commodity. In addition, we've got a domestic supply curve. Now the word domestic here means European because remember your authors are based in the United Kingdom. So the way to read this is kind of similar to the way you read a demand curve. If the if this is the price P1, to determine the supply of output, you go like this, and so Q1 would be the supply of output. 
if the price were to fall, let's say to P2, now you can see that the subscript doesn't indicate how big the price is. So here in this case, P2 is less than P1. P2 just means the second price I want to talk about. P1 just means the first price I want to talk about. So P2 doesn't have to be bigger than P1. It could be less as it is here. So if the price were to fall to P2, then you go to the domestic supply curve and down, and you'd see that in response to a fall in price, output goes down because farmers are going to get less money for their output, and so they decide to produce less. So that's the way to read a supply curve. Right, let me clean this up. Let me also say something. I will discuss it in more detail later. One can show, and lots of the effort in Intermediate Micro and Econ 4010 goes to showing this, that there's a relationship between the domestic supply curve and the marginal cost curve. It is the firm's marginal cost of output. In fact, the domestic supply curve is equal to marginal cost. And the reason I don't want to go, of course, I can't go into the details, but the intuitive reason is that if price is $10 a unit, then if your marginal cost is less than $10 a unit, you'd want to produce as, as much as possible because you'd be making a profit on every on everything, on every unit. If the price is $10 and the marginal cost is $15 a unit, you, you wouldn't want to produce that much because you'd be making a loss. So the only way you're going to be happy with the production level if the price is $10 a unit is for you to produce anywhere marginal cost is equal to $10 a unit. So that's the, the intuition there. Now we finally have to talk about the rest of the world. The rest of the world, think about a commodity, a widely traded agricultural commodity like corn or flour or rice. Uh, corn or wheat or, or rice. What we're going to assume is that there's a world price and that Europe, which is the domestic market we're talking about here, is a small part of the world. So the Europeans perceive the world supply curve as being flat. They're essentially taking the world price as given, almost acting like a competitive purchaser of food. Now, this is an, what we're going to be studying is the interaction between the European domestic market and the, Europe, and, and, and the world market. Okay, so, so we're going to assume that the, the world supply is fixed. That means the marginal cost of, of the foreigners is fixed. So this is the marginal cost of the rest of the world, and the early one was the marginal cost in Europe. So the marginal cost in Europe is rising with output, because as your output goes up, it gets harder and harder to produce in a place like Europe, and so costs go up. But the world is a really big place, and so as Q goes to the right, the marginal cost in the world actually doesn't increase, at least according to this model. Because the world is so big, you can expand agriculture and and not have to, to to pay more money. The policy issue that we're going to study, as I said before, is a tariff. The tariff causes food that's imported into Europe to be more expensive than the world price. So the world price plus the tariff is the amount of money that European consumers have to pay if they want to buy food that's imported from the rest of the world. So let's see uh, just at the grand scale first, and we'll get into the details in the next video, what happens when a tariff is imposed. Without a tariff, the reigning price is the world price. 
let's ask first what consumers demand at the world price. Well, you get that by looking at the demand curve. And the domestic demand curve at the world price is at point D, and therefore L is the uh, total amount of food that Europeans, which is the, who are the, the domestic people in this model, Europeans de demand at this world price. I'll refer to the world price as H. So at a price of H, demand by domestic demand is L. That is going to be divided into food that's purchased from domestic suppliers and food that's purchased from the rest of the world. Food that's purchased from domestic suppliers you obtained by looking at the domestic supply curve. At a price of H, the domestic supply curve is at point A, and therefore F, or another way to write it would be G GF, is the amount of food that's supplied domestically. So that's domestic supply with a price of H. Now domestic demand was L. Domestic demand price H. So if demand is L and domestic supply is F, then the gap has to be taken up by imports. So imports is FL. The domestic supply takes care of GF, and the total of GF plus FL is GL, which is the total domestic demand. Finally, for this video, what happens when the tariff is imposed? When the tariff is imposed, the price changes from H to I. This is the price that European consumers face. So first, let's ask, how does domestic demand change? Domestic demand used to be at L. But now the price is at I, so if you look at the domestic demand curve and you have a price of I, you see that's going to end up at point C. So domestic demand now has shrunk. C is at the same level as K. So let me write it over here. The new domestic demand is GK. And that is smaller than GL, so domestic demand has shrunk, and that makes sense. The price has gone up from H to I. If the price has gone up, consumers don't want to buy as much stuff, and so you get a, a decrease in demand. Now let's address the same question we addressed before. Of that total domestic demand, GK, how much of it is supplied by domestic firms and how much of it is supplied by the rest of the world? Well, again, to answer that, let's look at the domestic supply curve. The domestic supply curve at a price of I is at point J. So IJ or GE those are the same lengths, is going to be the domestic supply under the new situation. So let me write it over here. The new domestic supply is going to be GE. Now the old domestic supply was GF. When you go from GF to GE, you have an expansion. You can see that expansion in the graph. The, the, old, the old domestic supply was this, and the new domestic supply is this. This makes sense. The reason for imposing the tariff is to help domestic firms. 
And it's not a surprise that when you do impose a tariff, because you're making foreign food more expensive, the output of domestic firms is going to increase. That's why the farmers, domestic farmers, want you to impose a tariff. How about the new imports? Well, imports are always the gap between domestic demand and domestic supply. Domestic demand is IC. Domestic supply is IJ. The gap has to be filled with imports. So JC, which is the same as EK, here, are going to be your imports. Maybe I should make a little table for the old value. The old domestic demand was GL. And GL is bigger than GK. The old domestic supply was HA, which is the same as GF. And GF is smaller than GE. The old level of imports was AD, which is the same as FL. And that is a lot bigger than EK. So you can see that what's happened is that when you impose a tariff, domestic demand has shrunk, domestic supply has risen, and net imports have fallen. So that's the conclusion of what is something called positive economic analysis, which is to describe what happened. In the next video, we want to try to develop normative economic analysis, which is some conception of good or bad. So we know what happened. Was this good or was this bad? I mean, clearly, we know that the domestic supply, when once you once you impose a tariff, domestic supply goes up, so that's good for farmers. Domestic demand goes down. Europeans are eating less food, so presumably it's bad for European consumers. Um, so you have some winners and some losers. Can you say anything on net about whether tariffs were a good policy for Europe or not? So that's the kind of so-called normative question that we're going to develop in the next video.